The Ultimate Marvel Universe existed as a place where the company could reinvent many of the most iconic characters, creating unique takes on beloved Marvel heroes designed to cater to a whole new generation of comic book readers. Whether it's Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man, Mark Miller and Brian Hitch's The Ultimates, or Miller and Andy Hubert's gritty reinvention of the X-Men, the Ultimate Universe has no shortage of intriguing new depictions of your favourite Marvel characters. And while many of these new iterations of classic characters have remained in the minds of readers for better or for worse, there is one that surprisingly fell by the wayside, not only by Marvel's fans, but also by the company as well. This was a comic that attempted to drastically reinvent the origin story of one of the company's most popular heroes, and found itself being erased from continuity only a few years after it was first created. It is, of course, Orson Scott Card and Andy Kubert, Ultimate Iron Man. First released as a five-part miniseries throughout 2005 and 2006, this series aimed to drastically update the backstory of Tony Stark, creating a wholly distinct Iron Man character from his 616 counterpart. The result, though, was an incredibly polarising book that divided opinion from many both inside and outside of Marvel, and as such, found itself being erased and completely undone by the end of the decade. The story behind the rise and fall of the Ultimate Universe's Forgotten series is truly fascinating, and in this video, I want to break down the history of how Ultimate Iron Man came to be, what the original ideas were for this five-issue series, and how it proved to be one of the universe's most divisive reimaginings, and how it quickly faded from the spotlight to obscurity. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. The character of Ultimate Iron Man was first introduced in July 2001's Ultimate Marvel Team-Up Issue 4, created by Brian Michael Bendis and Mike Allred. In this story, Peter Parker visits the Stark International Science Expo, when the event is crashed by a fleet of Latverian soldiers, who attempt to steal the Iron Man technology, causing both Spider-Man and Tony Stark to team up and defeat the soldiers. However, while this story would technically be the armoured hero's first appearance in in the Ultimate Universe, his formal introduction would actually come the following year, in issue one of Mark Miller and Brian Hitch's The Ultimates. Now, this series was an epic cinematic reimagining of the Avengers, and introduced Iron Man as Antonio Stark, a rich industrialist who offers to join a newly assembled S.H.I.E.L.D. task force designed to protect the Earth from any superhuman threats. Alongside Captain America, Thor, Giant Man, Wasp, and the Incredible Hulk, Stark becomes one of the premier superheroes in this newly created Marvel Universe. However, his status doesn't absolve him of his demons and personal problems. You see, throughout the Ultimates, Tony is riddled with self-doubt and anxiety, as well as frequently struggling with alcoholism, as we learn that he suffers from an inoperable brain tumour, something that caused him to use his remaining time alive to help others as both a philanthropist and a hero. In addition to his starring role in the Ultimates, this this version of Iron Man also appeared in many of the other crossover books published around this time, namely Ultimate Six, where he and the Ultimates worked alongside Spider-Man to fight a team of his most deadly villains, and the Ultimate Galactus Saga, where he works alongside the X-Men and the Fantastic Four to prevent the invasion of Galactus. Whilst Iron Man had become a major player in the Ultimate Universe throughout the mid-2000s, many readers still wondered about the true nature of his backstory and his origin. With the demand for an Ultimate Iron Man standalone series growing the more the character appeared in any of the other books. As a result, this comic would eventually come to fruition in May of 2005, and despite the anticipations, I think it proved to be unlike anything anyone could have expected. In late 2004, Marvel announced that an Ultimate Iron Man miniseries was being developed, brought to life by the creative team of writer Orson Scott Card and artist Andy Kubert. 
Now, whilst Cuba had been a mainstay in the Ultimate Universe for some time, the decision to appoint Card as the writer for this new Iron Man series proved to be incredibly polarizing, as although he had no experience in writing comic books, he was a widely celebrated science fiction novelist, penning books such as Ender's Game and The Tales of Alvin Maker. While he was definitely an outsider to the Marvel Universe and a writer who wasn't without his personal controversies, the notion of bringing in a successful sci-fi author to reinvent one of Marvel's biggest characters proved to be too intriguing for the company to turn down. Upon the announcement of this new series, Marvel's editor-in-chief Joe Quesada stated that, I'm an enormous fan of Orson's writing, and our assistant editor Nick Lowe has made it his personal mission to get Mr. Card to write Iron Man. Iron Man is a strong and much beloved character in the Marvel Universe. I know that Orson's new exploration and defining of him as a superhero will delight traditional comic fans, and definitely appeal to a whole new audience of fans drawn to the science fiction element in his storytelling. By hiring such a prominent science fiction author, clearly Marvel hoped that Card would present a fascinating reimagining of Iron Man's early years, and this does prove to be the case from the very first issue. You see, in issue one of Ultimate Iron Man, we don't actually get to see much of the titular character, and instead we follow Howard Stark, owner of the Stark Defense Corporation, as he struggles to retain control of his company from his rival Zebediah Stane. It's in the backdrop for Control that Howard meets and falls in love with Maria Serra, a scientist who specializes in retroviral regenerative tissue. Not only do the pair eventually marry, but they begin working together to create a bio-armor designed to shield an individual's body to the point of being invulnerable, with Maria also creating a virus that grows skin tissue and even limbs, believing that the two projects could be used together. However, when they run tests, Maria is accidentally infected with the virus, which proves incredibly dangerous once she and Howard discover that she is pregnant. Maria ultimately dies during childbirth, as Howard is forced to use an experimental prototype of the bioarmor to save the life of his newborn child, who he subsequently names Antonio after Maria's brother. Meanwhile, Stain uses this situation to complete his hostile takeover of the Stark Defense Corporation, only for Zebediah to discover that the bioarmor was never actually patented, meaning that that despite taking over Howard's company, he still doesn't have control of this technology. Desperate to obtain control of Howard and Maria's research, Stain tortures several Stark employees, eventually learning that both Howard and Antonio have fled to Italy. Here, we see a now four-year-old Antonio Stark still wearing the blue bio-armor, as we learn that the regenerative virus he was born with has caused tissues only normally found in the brain to grow all throughout his body, essentially making making him a walking brain. The pair's solitude in Italy is abrupt though, as Stain ambushes them and manages to kidnap Tony, washing the armor off from his skin and exposing his body to air for the very first time. Thankfully, Howard is able to rescue his son, with Zebediah arrested soon after, but it's this incident that leads to the development of a brand new version of the bio armor, one that Tony can wear without it hampering his everyday life. The comic then flashes to different periods in Antonio Stark's life, as he begins studying at the Baxter Building, a government think tank for child prodigies, where he develops ideas for a weaponized version of his father's armor, and meets Zebediah's son, Obadiah Stane, who blames Tony for his father's incarceration and subsequent death, even going as far as to plant false evidence throughout the Stark home, framing Howard for the murder of Zebediah Stane. Obadiah's plan does come to fruition, and Howard is sadly jailed for Zebediah's murder. And with his father falsely imprisoned, the now teenage Tony Stark assumes control of the Stark Defense Corporation, taking back his father's company whilst continuing to work on his prototype armor, with the intent on using it to seek revenge on Obadiah Stane and clearing his father's name. This story is continued in the second volume, released throughout late 2007 and 2008. Here, Tony suits up as Iron Man for the very first time, stopping a terrorist attack in New York City. It's also during this period that Tony's childhood best friend, James Rhodes, also begins working with him, building his own armor to partner Iron Man as War Machine. Meanwhile, we learn that Obadiah is working with the men responsible for the failed terrorist attack, with the leader convincing Stane to 
to put a hit out on Howard Stark's life, with Howard being shot while in prison and left in the ICU, causing Tony to suit up as Iron Man and confront Obadiah Stane. Here, Obadiah insists that Dolores, the leader of the terrorists, was responsible for the assassination attempt on his father's life, with Tony sparing Obadiah and choosing to instead meet with Dolores on a plane, where the villain attempts to bargain with Stark, promising to give him the location of a series of nukes he's placed throughout the city in exchange for the Iron Man armour. As Tony searches the plane, he discovers a bomb hidden on the cockpit. As Dolores flees and leaves both Tony and Obadiah for dead, Tony does manage to disarm the bomb though and save both himself and Obadiah, before eventually discovering that Dolores has been murdered at his home. With this, both Stark and Obadiah believe that someone is out to kill all of them, with Tony visiting Howard, who is now out of the ICU, who tells him the person responsible is Loney, his ex-wife, and the former partner of Zebediah Stane. As such, Tony, Howard, Obadiah, and Rhodey travel to Utah, searching for Loney, where they're suddenly attacked by the terrorists once again, injuring War Machine and taking Howard captive. Tony and Obadiah follow the terrorists to Loney's hideout, where they find her holding Howard at gunpoint, threatening to shoot him if Tony doesn't hand over the Iron Man armour. Tony reluctantly takes the suit off, only for Loney to shoot him in the head as he does it, seemingly killing him. However, due to the regenerative virus he was born with, Stark's body quickly heals as he rises from the ground and fights Loney. Eventually beating her, Tony rushes to tend to his father, only for Loney to grab another gun in desperation. But before she can shoot, she's suddenly shot and killed by her own son, Obadiah. As Tony and Howard get to their feet, Obadiah tells the pair that they're all evil even, and he's finally free from his mother's manipulation. The three stumble out of the villain's lair and boldly look to the future as the comic ends. As you can probably imagine, Orson Scott Card's Ultimate Iron Man series proved to be incredibly divisive upon its first release. While this comic did keep some of the core tenets of the classic character, it was a huge reinvention of the Iron Man mythos, one that was not only so far removed from his classic 616 counterpart, but also felt too distinct from the character fans had come to know in the Ultimates. The origin story fans had known prior to this series involved Tony being one of two sons of Howard Stark, alongside his estranged brother Gregory, and later develops a brain tumour as an adult, inspiring him to become Iron Man. In fact, you could actually argue that Card's reinvention strips Tony of his actual purpose for becoming a superhero, as in the Ultimates, it's his diagnosis that after years of being an egotistical war profiteer, inspires him to have a change of heart and try to make the world a better place. By establishing that Tony was Iron Man years before this, and his affliction stemmed from a regenerative virus he was born with, you could actually say that it makes Iron Man a victim of circumstance, as opposed to someone who suffers a life-changing event that makes him rethink his entire life purpose. Because of the mixed response to this series, Marvel were quick to retcon Ultimate Iron Man out of continuity, with Mark Miller's 2011 series New Ultimates vs Avengers establishing that Card and Cubit's story was actually just a TV show that existed in the Ultimate Universe. From here, Miller would reaffirm the original origin story by reintroducing characters such as Tony's brother Gregory, who would become one of Ultimate Iron Man's biggest villains, whilst the 2012 series Ultimate Comics Iron Man would flesh out Tony's backstory even more, establishing that his father was killed by a shady organisation known as Mandarin International. And with this, Card and Cubit's Ultimate Iron Man quickly became forgotten about by both fans and Marvel themselves. While I do think it's sad that a project multiple people clearly worked hard on was discarded so quickly, I do think it's hard not to feel that this was ultimately for the best. While it was certainly an interesting reinvention, Ultimate Iron Man only served to confuse readers and contradict what had already come before, doing little to connect itself to the version of Antonio Stark fans had come to know in the other Ultimate comics. To me, this series is one of the biggest missed opportunities in the history of the Ultimate Marvel Universe. A strange attempt at reimagining a beloved Marvel hero that failed to resonate with those who had already become invested in the character. And its quick descent from release to retcon makes it hard for me to view Ultimate Iron Man as anything other than a failed series that will ultimately be lost to time.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you'd like to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. And if you want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. That's all for this video though. Again, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope I'll see you next time. So until then, take care and keep reading.